I want to just do a quick review of the JavaScript language because I know everybody has covered it, although admittedly it may be a year or more before you looked at JavaScript code, but hopefully I'll refresh your memories fairly quickly. Obviously you're all uh, confident programmers, so I don't need to go into the basics of programming. It's more the syntax and some of the semantics of JavaScript specifically. That's all I really want to cover. And then we have, uh, and that's by way of foundation really, before we get into uh, the central topics of this, this module. And so I'm going to start with these slides here. I'm going to look at JavaScript from two perspectives. A, how do we represent data or state in the JavaScript language? It's all based on one construct, which is kind of nice, just the, the object construct. And then I'll talk about the behavioral side of JavaScript, how do we represent behavior? And it's all centered around one construct as well, which happens to be called a function. JavaScript does has, have classes. They were introduced more recently to the language, well, by reason, I mean 2015, I think maybe for some reason, I guess, but we won't be using classes at all. All of the JavaScript code that you will see with Frank and myself will be based on the function construct. Okay, so let's start our way through these slides here. Bear with me for a second now. So I'll just give, uh, just because I feel I should give a quick background to the language. That'll only be a minute or two. And then we'll talk about data or state representation. I think that will really occupy the entire lecture today. I won't get into the behavior or logic side until the next lecture. Uh, I always show these graphs. Uh, what this is showing you is the popularity of various languages on the GitHub platform. They can they monitor the use of the various languages across various repositories. And for a number of years now, JavaScript has been the number one language. So it's very important for any computer science graduate to be familiar with that language. This is a the Stack Overflow do a survey every year on the usage of languages across the community. And this is just for the year 2021, but uh, take it from me for the last number of years, JavaScript has also been top of their list. Uh, so it's a very good language to have as part of your suite of languages. A lot of text here. I'm not really going to talk my way through this uh, line by line. Be a bit too boring, but the only thing I want to try, just one or two things I want to highlight, and it is the this thing called ECMAScript. ECMAScript is the specification for the JavaScript language. Now, oddly enough, the JavaScript language predates ECMAScript. JavaScript was created by a guy called Bernard back in 1991 ish. Whereas ECMAScript, the specification only started to emerge around 1997. Uh, so ECMAScript is the specification of a language, strictly speaking, and there is only one implementation of that uh, specification, and it is JavaScript. Um, so whenever people talk about ECMAScript, JavaScript, they're really talking about the same thing. And you can see that the ECMAScript language, there were a number of releases of it over the years. So it started back in 1997. And then around the this period here, it started to die off, mainly because there was a feeling that the language had no real future. Because at the time, JavaScript could only be executable in the browser. Yeah, couldn't be executed outside of it, couldn't be executed on a server or anything like that. Uh, and it wasn't really until the Node platform, which I mentioned down here, it wasn't until the Node platform came on stream, which it is around 2009, that we now could write JavaScript outside of the browser. And that really uh, brought a lot of focus back into the language. And that's really why it's really due to the Node platform that the JavaScript language is so popular today. Uh, so you can see 2009 was when Node was released. 
that's when the ECMAScript specification started to re-emerge. So there was a, a release of the ECMAScript specification called ES5 in 2009. Now, okay, there was a big gap then until 2015. And the 2015 specification, which we refer to as ES6, that was a landmark uh, release because it defined a number of new features for the JavaScript language, mainly to be consistent with other languages that were present in the community, in particular languages like Java and other object-oriented languages. So, uh, and from 2015 onwards, there has been a release of the ECMAScript language every year. So we talk about ES6, ES7, ES8. They're often referred to as by their year now rather than that number. So we talk about ES2015. And so the only reason I'm mentioning this at all is because I'll often refer to ES6, pre-ES6 and post-ES6. ES6, ES6, as I said, was, was really a landmark publication of the ECMAScript language. Right. Uh, the, the, the problem, though, is if we write JavaScript, if we write kind of modern JavaScript, which is ES6+, plus, then it's quite likely that there are browsers out there which predate uh, 2015. And so they can't interpret the JavaScript language that we're writing. Hence, it has to be converted back to the ES5 version of the JavaScript language. And that conversion is referred to as transpilation. So we always have to be conscious of that, especially if we're writing JavaScript that's going to run in a browser. Uh, slightly less of a concern, but it is still a concern if we're writing JavaScript that's going to run on the server, i.e. on top of Node.js. We always have to transpile our code back to ES5 if it's going to be running in the browser, just to ensure that every browser can run whatever application we're developing for the browser. Now, we don't have to worry about that. We're going to be writing modern JavaScript, that is ES6+. Plus. Uh, but there is a tool there called the Babel tool, or Babel, don't know how you pronounce it, uh, which does the translation for us, which I'm mentioning down here. That's just, again, by way of uh, background, really. Uh, we, we don't ever have to worry about translation. Babel will do it for us. It will be built into any development environments that we're going to be using. Right, <laughs> that's my background. Uh, I, don't, I, I didn't time myself, I'd say it was less than two minutes. So first aspect of JavaScript that I want to look at is how we represent data or state. Now, obviously JavaScript allow, has primitives associated with it and the primitives are all of the usual things, uh, numbers, strings, booleans, it has the null value, which is kind of familiar to us from, uh, from Java. It has this peculiar value as well called undefined, uh, which is something that's going to pop up quite a lot for you, mainly as a source of an error, as it turns out. But there is, there is kind of a, a difference between null and undefined. Uh, so where the undefined value emerges is if you declare a variable and you do not initialize it, then by default, it is assigned the value undefined. It's not assigned null, it's assigned the value undefined. So that this is a value, but it's a peculiar kind of thing. So that's one case where undefined arises. And there is a second case though. The second case is where you will come across it more often. But for now, that will do us. Uh, if we declare a variable, we don't initialize it, then the runtime will assign the value undefined to it. It's badly named. It should be no 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 value or something like that, but uh, undefined goes back to the very beginning of the JavaScript language, which, which was 1990, and I'm not too sure what Bernard Eich, who was the guy that created the language, I'm not too sure what he's thinking was at the time as to why he made a distinction between null and undefined, but there you go. Let's not talk about it any longer because we'll just tie ourselves up in knots. So primitives are pretty straightforward, okay, uh, apart from this undefined uh, peculiarity. Uh, can I just stop for one second? I'm getting a lot of Slack messages coming through, and I'm not sure if it's related to what's happening here. Just give me one second. No. Uh, no. 
Okay. Right. Uh, apart from primitives, the only other uh, structure available to us in the JavaScript language for representing state or data is the object structure, uh, which we're going to spend the rest of this lecture talking about. The other point that I want to make is that JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. What that means is if you declare a variable and you assign it one particular type of value, let's suppose we declare a variable and assign it a numeric value, in the very next line, we can assign a string to that same variable. Uh, the runtime isn't going to complain about that. You cannot do that in Java, for example. In Java, as you know, when you declare a variable, you have to declare what type of variable it is, and you can only assign values of that type to that variable. That's in Java. That's why we say Java is a statically typed language. JavaScript is dynamically typed. You can assign any value, any type of value to any variable at any time that you want to. That, that gives us a lot of power, but it also is very problematic, uh, and it can be a source of lots of errors. But it's, uh, it's native to the language, so we can change that. Now, I'm going to run through a few samples uh, rather than just all slides. And the samples come as a download with the first lab associated with this section. So you'll find them in this lab here. Don't, don't, don't no need to go looking at it now, but you, you'll get them when uh, in that lab. So the, the, uh, the process is you go to VS Code download the archive and unzip it and then import it into VS Code. So what you'll be importing is this guy here. And I've got a whole bunch of JavaScript files and I've got one HTML file. What you'll also need to do is install a an extension or a plugin for VS Code. I explain how you do that in the lab. And essentially all the extension is, is a standard uh, web server. And when you install it, what you'll notice is down here on the bottom of my, in the status bar of VS Code, there'll be a link called Go Live. And if you click that, you're essentially starting the web server and it will serve the contents of whatever project you're currently looking at. Now, because this has only one HTML file, it's gonna serve this particular file up to the browser. So let's just do that. Okay, that's all we get from the index.html. If we look at the index.html, it's not terribly interesting at one level. So, you know, that's that line there is what generated that. We don't really care about the HTML though in this uh, index.html page. What we're really interested in is what's happening in the browser's own console. So what you need to do is open the developer tools in Chrome. And if you don't know how to do that, you go up to the top right here and you select tools, more tools, sorry, and developer tools. So it opens this uh, panel on the right hand side, number of tabs to it, but for, uh, for this lab anyway, the only tab we're interested in is the console tab. So let's select, let's select that. Back to VS Code. What you notice as well in this index.html is that I've got a number of scripts here. And what I'm gonna be doing is enabling them one by one. And that's by way of, uh, and I'm doing that to uh, demonstrate various aspects of objects, uh, essentially. So if I take the script, this one here, they're all disabled at the moment, and I enable it. Uh, what's nice about this server that I've installed, it's called the live server, uh, which I, I have running now at the moment. What's nice about it is if you make changes to your uh, HTML files, then it will automatically refresh the browser tab. So because I've now enabled the script here, that means when I save this file, 
it's actually going to run and you can see it's referring to this file here which is this one so if i look at that okay it has some very very prim basic uh javascript farming uh, and just let's just spend a minute on this file here i know this is very primitive stuff now to be talking to third year students about but let's just bear with me uh, so i've just got a few variable declarations and they are all primitives how do you declare a variable you use the keyword let the variable name and i'm assigning it a value so it looks like foo one is going to be assigned an integer foo two is a string foo three is assigned a boolean foo four is assigned null foo five isn't uh foo okay pi is assigned a value foo five down here where's foo five uh foo I had a foo five, sorry. Oh yeah, there it is. Foo five isn't assigned anything, so that's going to be our undefined at some stage. Uh, I have a console.log, and you probably already know when you have a console.log, that will output whatever you're asking it to to whatever the, the console is in the context of which you were in the code. Now the console and context uh, or context here is going to be the developer's tool console. So that console.log should output to the developer tools console, which we'll see in a second. So if I save this change and go back to my browser. So this stuff here now is being generated by my primitives JavaScript file. And so the very first line is all of this stuff here. Okay. And that's consistent with that is consistent with this console.log. I know this is basic now, but I'm going to pause for a second just in case anybody has any initial questions. No, all very simple. That's good. Uh, the, the only mildly interesting thing about this line here is I'm reassigning, uh, I, sorry, I'm assigning a different value to foo1. Uh, I, obviously, I obviously don't use the let keyword here because I'm not declaring foo1. I've already declared it uh, earlier on. That's fine. If we take this line here though, foo2, I'm assigning the value 10. And that's an example now of this dynamic typing because you can see foo2 there at the top I initialized it to a string, but now I'm assigning, assigning it an integer. Uh, and that's perfectly okay as far as the JavaScript runtime is because of this dynamic typing. Moving on, I've got foo5, which I've not initialized. But when I do a console.log of foo5, what do I get? I get undefined, which is the actual value, quote unquote, associated with that variable. And that's it, I guess. Uh, now, the only thing, other thing is, I'm declaring these variables here with the keyword let, but I've used a different keyword const when I'm declaring pi. And I have a slide on it, which I'll come back to, which I'll come on to in a second, but the essential difference between const and let is, when you declare a variable with let, you can subsequently reassign a different value to that variable. Whereas when you declare a variable with the keyword const, you cannot reassign it a different value uh, subsequently. So if I enabled this line down here, and try to assign a different value to pi and save it, and go back to my console, and you can see I'm getting a I'm getting, uh, sorry, an error. And the error is essentially saying you, you can't reassign a value to a const. Now, later on, we'll see me doing something with const variables, which seems to be counterintuitive to what I just said to you there. But uh, again, I'll talk about that when, the, when it arises. But for now, that is the difference between const and let.
back to my slides. Primitive types, yeah, declare them with keyword less. Uh, there are various rules in terms of the, the identifier uh, that you declare, that you define for variables. I'm not going to go into them, but there's the usual kind of things. You can't have a space in an identifier name. You cannot begin an identifier with a numeric character. Uh, so it's the usual kind of things, I guess. Just moving on to this line here. Uh, in the early days of JavaScript, you had to terminate every statement with the colon. And that essentially told the runtime where a statement ended. But that now is no longer necessary. The runtime is almost clever enough to work out where statements end at this stage. So we don't... Well, sometimes you'll find me uh, terminating statements with colons. Do I do it actually in the sample as a matter of interest? Yeah, I've got lots of them there. And that's really a force of habit, really, because in the early days of JavaScript coding, we had to do it. But in more recently, it's not really necessary. So like if I take out colon there, it's not really going to cause any problems. i am just get rid of this again. So it doesn't show my error. And if I save, go back to my browser, you know, there, there are no errors as such. It doesn't complain about that. I mentioned there a moment ago about Babel or Babel, which takes your modern JavaScript code and converts it back into pre-ES6 code. Turns out that Babel automatically inserts colons at the end of each statement for you anyway in the code that it's in the ES5 code that it generates. So I'm saying that at the bottom um, of the screen here that Babel performs what's called uh, ASI, automatic semicolon insertion. That's just by the way. Uh, in the code that we write though, you know, you don't need to use the semicolon at all. And even if you sometimes do and sometimes don't, it doesn't matter. There are odd cases where if you've got a, a line, a, a statement that spans a number of lines, physical lines in your code, then there are edge cases where you actually have to put in the semicolon. It's never going to arise with us, I don't think. Uh, so if you do get an error for code that looks perfectly right as far as you're concerned, it may be due to the fact that you have a multi-line statement somewhere and you should probably stick in a semicolon just to help the runtime understand where your multi-line statement ends. I don't think it's ever going to arise, but... Uh, you may write very fancy code that actually does require it. Hmm. Let and const, I've kind of covered that. Const is obviously short for constant, and a constant is something that doesn't change. So uh, it's, it's, it's good practice. Sorry, well, it's bad practice to just use let all of the time if you know for a fact that a particular variable that you're declaring is not going to be changed. It, it's better practice to use const in that case. And really, the, the, you're encouraged to use const, be, const because it's, it tells the person that's reading your code, because quite often you're going to be reading somebody else's code and other people are going to be reading your code, that if you declare variables using const, then it's making clear to the person reading the code that that variable is not going to be reassigned to different values subsequently. So it's your intent uh, and you're making that clear in your declarations. The lazy thing is to always use let uh, and let the, let the person reading the code discover for themselves that some of the variables that were declared with let were, are really constants. So it's just good practice really to use const when you think it's, uh, it's warranted and you know for a fact the variable isn't going to change. Also here I'm saying that all variables adhere to what's called block scoping. This is the exact same as in Java. That means any variable you declare inside a block, and a block is any piece of code that's uh, wrapped with curly braces. So for example, in an if statement or a for loop or a function or a class, we, we know from Java, we use curly braces to delineate where the that block begins and ends. So when you declare a variable inside any block in JavaScript, which is the same as Java, 
uh, its scope is that block. That used to be the case in pre-ES6 JavaScript. It had a different scoping uh, mechanism called function scoping, but we're not going to be writing pre-ES6. Now, objects, though, are the only interesting part or the really interesting part of JavaScript data representation. And this object structure is what I'm calling the core unit of composition for any kind of complex data. What is an object? An object is a set of key value pairs. Uh, and the a key and a value combined is referred to as a property. So we could say an object is a set of properties. The syntax for declaring an object, you wrap it actually in curly braces, although these the curly braces here really have nothing to do with block scoping. Block scoping relates more to logic that you're writing, um, but the language actually uses the curly braces uh, for objects as well as it turns out. So uh, the syntax for the literal syntax for declaring an object is started with a curly brace whatever you, key you want to use, which is really an identifier, the colon symbol followed by the value. So that key value pair there is one property, comma separates the properties. I've got another key value pair for another property and so on and so forth. So that's the literal syntax. Keys must be unique within an object because they're really uh, identifiers within, uh, within an object. And the values can be of any type. They may be primitives or they may be objects themselves. And it's when the values are objects themselves that things get interesting. So you can nest objects within objects. And that's really what you will encounter a lot in this module. Or the value could be an array. So that's the object construct and the array construct. Those two constructs are sufficient to allow us represent any kind of complex data that we want to. There is actually a third option, right? The value could actually be a function. I don't think you will see that directly uh, in this module. It will actually be there in the background, all right, though. But uh, so that's where we, we're kind of moving outside the state or data space when we talk about functions. But as it turns out, an object's property could actually be a function as well. Here's an example of a simple object. You don't have to use the const keyword now, but uh, I am in this case. And so it looks like this object has two properties, where the key of one is first name, and the value is that. The key is another key is last name, the value is that. In terms of manipulating objects, we have two representations. Again, I'm not sure why Bernard Ike gave us two ways of uh, manipulating or sort of accessing particular properties within an object, but we do anyway. So there is the dot notation. And so if we've got this expression me dot first name, where me is the object that I had on the previous screen there, me dot first name, that expression evaluates to Dermot. That's the dot notation. Uh, the subscript notation looks like this, where you, uh, you use the square brackets or the uh, subscript, uh, characters, if you like, and the key has to be enclosed in quotes. So you have to convert it into a string. If you leave out the quotes there, that has a very different meaning and we'll get, get onto it in a minute. So this expression here, me, uh, first name, uh, also evaluates to the string dearment. Uh, in term, if you want to change a particular property, then it's the same notation. So here it looks like I'm going me that first name, and because this expression here is appearing to the left of an equal statement, then it looks like I'm making an assignment, which it is. But effectively, what I'm doing is I'm changing the value associated with this key to another string. I could have changed it to a different type of variable, and the runtime wouldn't complain. But uh, there you go. Similarly, for the subscript notation. This expression here uh, is looks like I'm changing the value associated with the last name, key. Subscript notations support, yeah. So let's supposing I've got an ordinary variable called key here, 
I could, could probably should have called it something else, but uh, it's just an ordinary variable and I'm assigning it a string. That now means if I've got an expression like this over here on the right, me subscript key, note I don't have quotes around the key now. So what's going to happen here is it's going to, the runtime is going to say, well, that must be a variable. And it goes looking for that variable and it finds it on the left there and it substitutes the variable value, the variable's value into this expression here. So that now becomes me subscript first name. So you just uh, you need to be careful not to put quotes here and remember to put quotes here. <laughs> Here's the gotcha, right? Objects declared with const are mutable. Mutable, mutable means they can be changed. Now, I said to you earlier on, when you declare a variable using the const keyword, you cannot reassign it a different value. That still holds. However, if you assign an object to a const, you can change the properties within that object. You can't, you cannot assign a different object to that const, but you can change the properties within the object that you did assign to it. And that's counterintuitive, and that's something that caught people when this const keyword was introduced to the JavaScript language, which is, I think, around ES6 or ES7. And it was a kind of a source of uh, confusion, really, but there you go. Sample two, uh, let's see, is there anything in sample two? That might interest us. So the way you kind of play with this uh, code base now is you, you first of all go to the index.html and you disable the script that you're no longer interested in and you enable the one that you are interested in. And you save it. And let's open up the script as well. And we'll just scan it first before we see what it actually generates. So again, I've got a, an object here. And the running joke every year is this object has some details about me, most of which are not true, uh, but it doesn't get it that really anymore. Uh, there you go. So it's an object anyway with some simple properties you know, where each property is a primitive. And so I've got a console.log of me.name and me subscript address. So that console.log should output the American lives at uh, one main street. And if we look at the console, that's what it's producing. Uh, is it producing? Yeah, sorry, yeah, there at the top. Sorry. What happened? What happened? Let's see. Did I save everything? I didn't. Okay, I saved that. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Sorry. This is the one I need to enable. Disable that. Save. happening what am I getting wrong oh yes yeah, sorry yeah. well I kind of I could have two scripts enabled but uh, I don't particularly want that right uh, so Dimmer kind of lives that one main street Great. And close off that guy. Uh, what else? Okay, I'm just illustrating the fact that I can use a, a variable here within my subscript. So this is all going to evaluate fine. Me subscript BB, where it's going to evaluate BB. Sorry, it's going to, first of all, 
uh, find the variable BB and substitute in bank balance uh, into that expression. And so we get what we expect. Oh yeah, all I'm saying down here is that uh, you, you cannot do this, right? You cannot use BB in the dot notation format. So if I try to do that, let's see what I get. Oh yeah, there we go, I get undefined. Now, I've said so far that if you declare a variable and you do not initialize it, then that variable has the value undefined. There is a second case where undefined arises though, and it is if you try to reference a property of an object that does not exist, the property does not exist, then the value that you will get back is the value undefined. And that's what's happening there. The expression me dot bb is returning the value undefined because there is no property in my object called bb. And again, that's something that uh, that's going to happen to you down the line. Not in cases as obvious as this now, but uh, certainly when you have objects within objects, when you've got nested objects and you're trying to reference a property within a nested object and the property doesn't actually exist within the nested object, you will get this undefined arising. And you'd have to discover why is that happening? And it's usually because you've either misspelled the property or you've misinterpreted the object structure itself. Because quite often now what's going to be happening is you're going to be getting objects returned by web APIs and you haven't, you haven't fully studied the structure of that object uh, that's returned by the web API. I'll pause again for a second just in case there are any issues. This is taking a lot longer than I thought actually, but there you are talking too much, I think. Right, that's manipulating objects, uh, object characteristics. Objects are dynamic. So you can actually add and remove properties from an object at runtime. Uh, I'm not gonna go through, I'm not gonna demonstrate all of these now, but we'll just show you the code. So here I've got the me object again, and you can see this line here, I'm going me.employer equals whatever. There is no property up here though. There's no property called employer. So the effect of this line is essentially to add a new property to the object dynamically at runtime called employer. So that's how you uh, add properties to remove a property. The syntax is a bit odd really, but that's, that's the syntax there. So there's this delete keyword, and then you refer to the particular property. And so now if I do a console.log of me.age here, here's a question, what's this console.log going to output? Mm -hmm. Is anybody brave enough? No, it's going to output undefined because there is no property called age. I've just removed it here. Uh, objects can be nested is the next point. We're told to refer to sample 041. Um, as I said, it's when you start dealing with nested structures that uh, you start to wake up a little bit and realize this isn't as straightforward as I thought. So here I've got uh, the me object again, but now I've got name actually represented as a nested object and I've got finances as well as a nested object. Uh, but the, the, um, the principles in terms of the accessing the these nested properties is still the same, it's still the dot notation and the subscript notation. So if we take this expression here, uh, me dot name using the dot notation followed by the subscript notation first, that expression there now is obviously going to evaluate to Dermot. And you can mix and match the dot notation and the subscript notation. If I want to do this in complete dot notation, then I just go dot, 
God, there's a lot of things happening to me today. Sorry about this. Oh, I hit the escape key. Sorry. Give me a second. I have to come up with another um, keyboard shortcut for that now. Okay. Where was I? Messed it up. Uh, me, oh, okay, dot first. That's obviously going to work as well because there is a property called first within the nested object called name. And I've got something else going on over here as well. Over here, I'm just using the subscript notation everywhere. Another typical kind of beginner's mistake might be if you put a, if you put a dot in there, that's just invalid syntax. Let's see. Save it. Go back to my index.html. I'm now looking at, I'm now looking at, should be 041, I don't have a 041 there. I'll just put in one. So the error here now is actually referring to uh, the syntax mistake that I made, which was using a dot over here, which is, which is sorry, using a dot over here, which is not valid syntax. So the expectation now is that you play with these yourselves. Uh, a property variable can be, uh, sorry, a property value can be a variable. Looking at 042. So you can see this line here. In the me, I've got key call name, and I'm referring to a variable. Called, happens to be called the same uh, call name as well. That's just coincidental, but it's obviously referring to this object up here. But that's going to evaluate. That's that's syntactically that's sound. Uh, the only what I'm mentioning down here in this line here, this commented out that, and this is something that was introduced in ES seven, I think maybe. If you've got a key and a variable within an object, and they have the exact same. Uh, um, they are they are the exact same. Then you can, as a shorthand, you can write it like that. Okay, so that really expands to me. Sorry, it expands to name colon name, and you'll see me doing that every now and again. So again, it's just a shorthand that was introduced in a newer form of uh, JavaScript. But the overarching point is the fact that you can have a variable. If we go back to the simpler form of it, you can have a variable as a value within an object where that variable refers to another object. But it's essentially just an, I'm nesting the name object inside this me object. Sometimes, um, sometimes you just want to extract the keys from an object. So there's this special, um, uh, th sorry, th this is how you do it here using this expression. Object here is a, a kind of a global object that comes with the JavaScript runtime. And that object has a method or a function called key. That's how you evaluate this. Or that's how you interpret this, sorry. Uh, it looks very like, you know, JavaScript, sorry. It looks very like Java code where you've got 
class name and method name. That's essentially how you would interpret it as well. We would, we would call this a method as well in JavaScript. Uh, so that's a global object. Uh, that's a method associated with it. And if you pass it a data object yourself, something that you have created, then what this entire expression will return is an array of strings where the strings are the keys within this data object here. Similarly, if you want to just extract the values, then this is the expression that you use. And so again, this method returns an array where the entries in the array are the values associated with this data object here. Of course, the values could be a mixture of different types of values. They could be strings, numerics, nested objects, et cetera, et cetera. Either way, they're all packed into one array uh, and then you just index into that array in the normal way. The in operator, sometimes you want to test, does a particular object have a particular property? That would arise like if you've got a function and that function could be passed different types of objects and you want to establish what type of object is it. And the way you might do that is to use the in operator. I think I have, well, if we just take this example here, right? This is how you would write it. So this expression name, and it has to be a string, name in me, where me is an object, that expression in, in our case would evaluate to true because we did have a property called name. Um, it would evaluate the false <laughs> if, if the me object didn't have the, the particular property. So you would use it in a typically in a NIF statement or in some sort of Boolean context. Uh, your total look of 0, 4, 2, which you can uh, yourselves. Now, uh, what I say every year to students, and so far I haven't been wrong, but that's not really any great claim on my part. And it is that every one of you will get this error at some stage during this module. And it's an error that people find difficult to interpret, even though I tell you, you're going to get it. And make sure you recognize it when you get it. But it still it turns out that when people do get it, uh, it kind of confuses them. And it's understandable. So let's just, uh, oh, we have time now, sorry. Yeah, I have to finish on this, I suppose. So I'm saying, uh, if you try and access uh, an invalid property, uh, sorry, if you try to um, interpret an invalid property of an object as being something other than undefined, then you're going to get this. And it's actually a runtime error now. It's not, uh, it's not silent, as we say. This generic expression uh, is trying to explain it to us. So let's say some object is some sort of data object, and we're trying to access a property that doesn't exist. So I've just called it bad property, which kind of makes sense. Um, that expression evaluates to undefined. That's fine. We know that so far. That's not an error research. However, if we try and do this subsequently, if we try and go some object dot bad property dot property x, where it seems like we're trying to access a property called property x of this nested object, but this is not a nested object. It's actually the undefined value. And you cannot interpret the undefined value as being an object. So this entire expression is going to actually crash our code. And so I'm saying it's fatal. And the error that you get is this error down here. Cannot read property of undefined. If we literally kind of say what it's saying, or uh, uh, interpret what it's trying to tell us, you're trying to access a property of the undefined value. And it just doesn't, you, you cannot do that. Can't do that for you. I've tried to uh, give you an example of it, um, demonstrate an example of it. So I've got this file here called 043. It's kind of worked while looking at this one before we uh, part company. And let's set our index to that. I'm going to close off the ones I'm not interested in anymore. I can save it for now, but I'm going to do it later.
Okay, so here goes. Um, okay, so we've got name and then we've got the me object. We've seen all that before. Now, I've got a console.log here of me dot first name dot deposit. So let's just enable that. And let's disable the other line for now. Sorry, me dot finance dot deposit. So again, I'll pose the question, what does that console.log, what will that output to the screen? Uh, me.finance, well, that's that's a valid expression. That's going to evaluate to this object up here. And then I'm trying to access a deposit property within that. That doesn't exist. And we've seen before that if you try and access a property uh, of an object that doesn't exist, then that evaluates to undefined. So I'd expect that console.log just to display undefined. It's not going to crash my program, though, and I can prove that if I just put a console.log of console.log of hello. I'd still expect this to run for me. Let's see. Yeah, that all worked fine. So that's that's not crashing. It's just my program isn't crashing. Where it crashes though is if I try and do this. If I now try, if I if I think deposit is valid and I'm trying to access a property of that, we've now already seen that this entire expression evaluates to undefined which is a value, but it's not an object. Uh, and it's certainly not an object that has a property called bank. So now when I run this code, this statement here is never going to execute because this statement here is going to cause my program to crash. And let's prove that to ourselves. There you go. So that's an error that you're going to get, as I'm saying, and just try and uh, apply it to the context that it will arise uh, for you. So that's objects. That's pretty much all we need to know about objects. You, what you need to be comfortable with is navigating nested object structures using a combination of the dot notation and the subscript notation being able to code that properly. Uh, that's really the only challenge, if you like. Uh, arrays, uh, obviously any language worth its salt is going to have an array structure or support an array data structure. And as we know, an array is an ordered list of values, unlike an object. An object is an unordered list of values. It doesn't have the notion of the first property, the second property, the third property. It doesn't work that way for objects, but for arrays, order is important. The way we, uh, the syntax for defining a literal array is the same really as most languages. It's your square brackets and your values sub separated by commas. The values can be of any type. They can be primitives, they can be objects, uh, they could be other nested arrays. An array I'm saying here can have a mixture of different types of values within them unlike in Java, for example, where you need to declare what are the types of the values in the array, or what is the type of the different values in the array. In JavaScript, you can have a mixture of types. In the small print, I am saying it may actually reflect poor design on the programmer's part if they have arrays which vary in different types within it. That's probably not a good idea, but it's allowed from the syntax of the language point of view. And as with any language, the way we access the individual elements within an array is by using the subscript notation, where we tend to refer to the subscript as an index starting at zero, as always. And the zero 05 script shows us examples of arrays, but nothing too interesting, really. So here's a very simple array declaration. Um, and here's where we're using the subscript notation using the index. So name subscript two is the third element as you might expect. 
Let's just be sure of that. Yeah, so the five here is from the first console.log. So I need to close that off. I'm not interested in that. The array again. Uh, all I'm illustrating here is standard for loops for iterating over an array. Uh, and I'm showing you the old style for loop, the ES5 one, which is very like the Java syntax for a for loop. There's a slightly, uh, but only slightly better form of it that was introduced in ES6. We often refer to it as the for of loop. So I just take a note of the syntax there. But again, it's for iterating over an, an array. As it turns out, we see later on that we don't tend to use the standard for loop when we want to iterate over an array. We use a different technique, but we'll see that later on. Uh, here's something that you don't necessarily need to know, but it's what's actually happening uh, deep within the bowels of the JavaScript runtime. Uh, natively, the JavaScript language doesn't have an array type built into it. Most of the languages do. The only type of data structure that JavaScript has built into it natively is the object structure. Now, but still, the language syntax does support arrays, but it turns out that arrays are actually stored natively as objects where the keys of the object are your indexes, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is what I'm seeing here. And the keys are actually converted to strings. As I say, you don't necessarily need to know that. Uh, it won't help you in your understanding of how to program arrays, which you're very familiar with anyway. But it's just a, a nice fact to be aware of. So what I'm saying here is that when you write an expression like that, which is normal array manipulation syntax, Internally, it's actually converted to this. And this looks like object structure manipulation where this is a key within this object. But both of those expressions actually mean the same thing. This is how we code it. This is how it's interpreted internally by the runtime. And, you know, we can approve that. I can change this statement here to, well, it happens to be two again, but uh, to a string. Let's make it zero. Subscript zero. And then save that. So we expect that console.log to output 12. Uh, which it doesn't because I've made a syntax error. Yeah, which is what we get there. So just a nice to know fact, but other than that, it doesn't help us. Moving on. Uh, so an array object, and the, the difference between an object that's actually representing an array as opposed to an ordinary object is the runtime will add some other useful properties to what I'm calling an array object, like the length property, if you want to find the length of the array. So you can write an expression like this. Uh, so there is a property called length automatically available to you. Then there are a couple of very useful methods that you can invoke on that array. Like we want to add elements and remove elements. 
to and from the beginning and end of the array. And so there's this uh, push and pop operation, push and pop and shift and unshift. Push and pop, I think, manipulate the end of the array when you want to add or remove elements uh, from the end of the array. Shift and unshift is when you want to add or remove elements to or from the front of the array. Join does what you expect it to do. There may be one or two other ones as well. Now, there are examples of those in the script that you can look through yourself. I've commented them out, but you can just comment them back in and just make sure you understand how they work. You've all come across the push and pop and shift and unshift operations before in other programming. Essentially, you're treating the array as either a stack or a queue. Uh, so you can play with these things yourselves later on. And so having objects and arrays available to us as two data structures for representing collections of information, really that's all we need to represent any type of complex data structure that we want to by just mixing the array and object primitives in any way that we want to. So I'm just giving you sort of some Englishy examples of them here. So there may be a case when you're implementing a particular problem domain that you want to have an array where each element in the array is, is also an array. Uh, so nested arrays, in other words, or two-dimensional arrays. So we might find ourselves writing an expression like this and you need to be comfortable understanding what that is saying or what particular part of your nested array you're trying to access. Or we might have an array of objects. And so an expression like this would make sense and you need to be comfortable uh, understanding that and writing that and so on for other examples. Uh, and I am saying down here, again, it's kind of a reminder to uh, a couple of slides back where you get this, uh, this commonly reoccurring uh, crash error is when you're accessing values within a nested data structure, um, you will often get this error thrown back at you. And as I said, you first of all need to understand why you're getting the error, uh, but it requires further debugging then to understand where it's coming from or what caused it, if you like. This is the last slide. Um, we've seen already in the very first script that I've shown you where we had a console.log statement that uh, implemented what's called string concatenation, okay, where we're using this plus to construct our string. Now, string concatenation is it's very error prone in the sense that if you accidentally leave out a plus here, then obviously that's going to cause this line of code to crash. Or if you accidentally leave out the, let's say the quote here, that's going to cause a crash as well, because the, now the entire expression doesn't evaluate properly. And so for those reasons, in ES6, we were given string templates String templates, I'm sure, is something you've come across in other programming languages. Many of the features that were introduced in ES6 and post ES6 were as a result of the JavaScript community requesting features that they used in other languages but were not available to them in JavaScript. And one of those features is string templates. And this is how we implement string templates in JavaScript. So instead of using concatenation, here we've got the same thing that we want to console.log, but we've wrapped it in one string. The only thing you've got to be careful about, though, is that this is not the single quote. This is actually the back quote or back tick. So you've got to wrap. The entire thing is what we call the string template. You've got to wrap your string template in these back tick characters. You can find them on your own keyboard. And then within the string, anywhere you have dollar curly brace, closed curly brace, in here you can have a reference to a variable 
or you can have any kind of complex expression and whatever is between the curly braces that is evaluated and the result of that evaluation is inserted into the entire string. And in this case, all we're doing with the entire string is console.logging it, but you could equally assign this expression to a variable uh, that's legitimate as well. So uh, in terms of uh, just syntax, backticks, and dollar curly brace, closed curly brace, and you can have any number of instances uh, of what are called the uh, interpolation. This is this part here is referred to as interpolation. You can have any number of these interpolation sub expressions within the entire string. Uh, you can also have multi line strings, which can sometimes be useful. I'm not sure if we ever really need to use them in our code. We certainly will use this kind of standard string template, all right. And again, you've got some examples of it in the 06 script, which I don't think I need to talk my way through. You can just look at it yourselves. Just have a quick look at it. Um, what am I doing? Just declaring an ordinary string here, an ordinary variable, sorry, another uh, variable, which is evaluated to constant. Here's an example. Sorry, now let's see. Uh, okay, we haven't seen functions so far, but I'm pretty sure you'll be able to work out what's going on here. I'm just declaring a function. It's past the variable and it does some sort of computation. Essentially, it's converting what it's converting imperial to metrics, to meters. That's all that line is really doing for me. Here's where the string templating comes in. So I'm assigning this template string to a variable. Uh, so you, you, need to, you should be able to work out that now for yourselves and then on console.logging it. I guess the import, the interesting thing is the fact, okay, here I'm just using an ordinary variable, but here I'm actually calling a function, this function here, calling a function, passing it a value. So whatever that function returns, and we can see what it's doing here, here's what it's returning. Whatever it returns is what is inserted into my overall string. And here I've got an example of a multi-line string. Okay, so again, uh, you can explore that yourselves. And that's it. So it was all about how we represent data. Uh, and the really interesting part is the notion of objects. So you need to be very comfortable coding and understanding objects, manipulating them, uh, navigating them. Uh, we have arrays as well. And finally, we talked a little bit about string templates. And uh, at the risk of annoying you at this stage, uh, I'm again ref reminding you of this commonly reoccurring runtime exception that can be thrown uh, that you need to be comfortable with understanding and interpreting. The debugging really depends on the nature of uh, where it occurs. Okay, that's it. Thanks.